talk for a few minutes about the architecture of time. Some things to think about, and I, I think we'll have more time for discussion in this session, and I know that all of you guys are full of beer and you're going to go to sleep anyway. I, I don't know why I'm even up here. There you go. Time. When we talk about time, we're talking about the Holy Spirit because the Spirit is the temporality of God. Now, we don't want to say that God exists in time in the way that we do. But the fact that we exist in time is a reflection of something that's in God. And what it reflects is that God the Holy Spirit moves from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the Father. He is the love of the Father for the Son and the love of the Son for the Father. And that motion from the Father to the Son and back to the Father again is the motion of the Spirit and which makes motion in God. And the Spirit is also the music of God because the Spirit is the breath of God. Music exists in time. Visual art, architecture, exists by itself in space. If we wanted to admire this room, I don't know that there's much that we would say, well, I admire this. Uh, it's just kind of a functional room. But if we had stained glass windows and you had some nice, you know, uh, well-carved piece of furniture up here and uh, a, a rose window back there or something, we would be looking at specific items in the room that are static and don't change. Music, however, exists in time. It carries time with it and different sounds of music, that is, different shapes of music, different kinds of melodies and constructs of music carry with them different atmospheres or feelings about what we're listening to. And so they affect, <clears throat> they affect our psychological movement. And so spirit, uh, music is important. It's important to God. Um, all speech is musical. I know some of you have heard me do this before, but i got to do it again, because not everybody has. Uh, you see, the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, exists as language, but until that language is out loud, you can't hear it. So the Spirit, or breath of God, has to make it out loud. And as soon as anything is out loud, it has musical qualities. For one thing, it's coming from a musical instrument. See? A percussion instrument. Actually, the percussion is in here. See, my voice is a musical instrument. It's a total musical instrument. What are the three kinds of musical instruments? Strings? Winds? A brass or winds? Wind goes through to make it. Percussion. Okay. Percussion. See? When I talk, I've got percussion going on. And I've got wind going on. Try to talk without having wind go through your pipe. Can't do it. Okay. And I've got vocal cords that are vibrating. That's a string. And whenever you talk, you are using all three aspects of the musical instrument that is you. You're taking breath down in here into this bagpipe. And then it comes out across this vocal cord and this percussion that governs how it's coming out. Isn't it? Okay. Yes. And, you see, my voice has melody. 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 Here? You hear the melody? Yes, it goes up and down, and it can be loud or soft. I can talk fast, or I can talk slow. So it has dynamics, which is loud and soft, and it has tone color. My voice doesn't sound like yours, and if I get sarcastic, my voice changes its tone color from a beautiful viola to an ugly oboe sound, or whatever. See, all the aspects of music, melody, Rhythm. When I talk, I have rhythm. When you talk, you have rhythm. It comes out in rhythm. And it comes out in form. Long sentences, short sentences, whole lectures. It has form. 
There is no aspect of music that's not there in speech. Now we enhance, we glorify speech when we concentrate that into what we call music. But you see, unconcentrated music is talking. Slightly concentrated is chanting. And really concentrated is singing. And super concentrated is opera singing. Okay? Most of us can't do that. I would, but I won't. So, the spirit, the breath, makes music. It's what he does. And when the Spirit comes in history, he causes music. All right. So he is causing music and he is causing movement in time. We talked about this some already. That when we progress out of Egypt into a wilderness space, into the in-between space, where things are concentrated, where we are up against the cherubim, where it's scary, but where the, all the blessings are, where all the treasure that the dragon guards is in there. And Jesus has killed the dragon. And so we can go in there just like Bilbo and get the, the treasure out that's guarded by the dragon. That's what you do. That's what a labyrinth is. And here's the treasure. In the, in the Holy of Holies, what was in there? There was the Word of God and a pot of manna and Aaron's rod a glorified person it's an almond right and almonds it bore bright uh, uh, ripe almonds and white flowers see elders white now this isn't white enough see some white yes we have some some elders here okay white glorified person Almond in Hebrew is watcher or looker or overseer. Bishop, governor, ruler. All right? In Latin, supervisor. In German, overseer. Okay? Whichever half of the English language you want to talk. So, that's what is in there. And it's locked up. This is the, the treasure room. And the three treasures are in there. The treasure of the mature glorified person. The treasure of life and the bread of God in that pot of manna. Food from heaven. And the treasure of the word of God. But they're locked up and they're cherubim here. And if you try to go in there and get the treasure, these cherubim dragons will blow out their flaming mouths and burn you up. That's where all these stories come from. But now, this veil is down, and all this stuff is being published out. And we have the gift of foreign languages, which says, the Holy Spirit will now help you translate this Hebrew stuff into all the languages of the world. And the glorified person is given out, because Jesus is glorified. And what color is his hair? It's white like wool. Now, and we're in union with him. So once we're baptized, we get Aaron's rod and we're glorified. You all have white hair. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> You'll get it. You live long enough. All right. Then, in, but in Jesus, you have it. And you have the completed scriptures. And you have the fullness of life in the Lord's Supper. Bread and royal wine. Wine to make you relax. Like that beer stuff that y'all had for lunch. I, however, stuck with the sacred drink. Diet Coke, except there's no caffeine in here, so... I need a Jolt Cola. I don't really. Now, that's, that's what we're coming here to get on Sunday morning, you see. Those whom he justified, them he also glorified. When your sins are forgiven, <coughs> when the minister says, Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Believe this and rejoice. Lift up your hearts. However your ritual does it. When you stand up from kneeling to confess your sins, you're glorified. The Father seeks worshipers. 
You got to be glorified to come into the heavens and, and worship. In Christ, you're glorified. You're given that first gift. And then you're given the gift of the tablets of the law, the completed word of God, which was locked up here and was only in Hebrew. Now you're, it's given out to you in English. Then you come here and you get the manna, the fullness of manna. All right, so we come, we get these things, we move in, and then we take them back out. Because there are people out there who need to hear the Word of God. There are people out there who need to uh, be ministered to by us who are glorified and restored. There are people that we need to feed. And just as God has been charitable to us to give us Jesus' body and blood, so we need to take out cups of cold water and be charitable to others. So that moving into the church and moving back out again is fairly fundamental. We want to reflect on that, okay? We want to reflect on the doorway into the church. And the normal way for people to come through that doorway. And as, as Protestants, we don't feel the need to have some holy water here where people can anoint themselves going in. But we do want to think about passing through that door from one area into another where we're coming in here where the gifts are and then carrying them back out. We want for the minister and his assistants to walk in, walk down the aisle. So even though we're going to stay in our seats, when you have several people walk down the aisle at the beginning of a service, it creates an impression that you're moving too. You, you psychologically follow that, even if you're not looking at it. That flow carries you with it, and then when he leaves the service and walks back out that way, that carries you with it psychologically. Okay? You feel the coming in and the going out as an official act. So that's, there's some architecture there. Do you want a center aisle or do you want two aisles on either side with a bunch of chairs in the middle, auditorium style? How many Baptist churches have you been in that are like auditoriums and they have aisles on the side and then chairs in the middle because the purpose of the meeting room is to hear a lecture? And then four times a year to have the Lord's Supper, which we're not sure why we do it, but we do it. <laughs> All right? But there's no sense of entry and exit. Now, that's I'm not saying that to be mean to Baptists. They're fine Christians, and there are a lot of things they do better than we do, but this isn't one of them. <laughs> okay, we want a center aisle. Not least because... We don't want all the young women in our church to have to go to other churches to get married in. And you know, you don't have to have marriages in a church. You don't, they don't have to be performed by a minister in the Bible. You know, fathers just got together and they made the contract and that was it. But it's a good thing uh, to have the blessing of the church on a marriage. People, ministers don't marry people. People marry each other. A minister... Per, the minister doesn't pronounce them man and wife. He just announces to everybody that they are man and wife, and he prays a blessing on them. Uh, that's a lot of people don't know that, but it's really that's how it is. Okay, uh, marriages are perfectly legal and legitimate before God, whether a minister is involved or not. Uh, but the bride of Christ comes to her groom in worship. We come in to where Jesus is, all right? And so it's perfectly appropriate in a Christian wedding to have that movement of the bride herself down here and to use Psalm 45, which celebrates the church's marriage to Jesus on an analogy of a woman's marriage to a man. So practically speaking, you want to send her aisle. And you want to send her aisle because of this motion, okay? Because of the time that is taking place. So that's one aspect of the motion of the Holy Spirit, this there and back again motion that he makes. He comes from the Father to the Son, the Son sends him back to the Father. That's the whole history of the world. The Father sent the Spirit into the creation at the very moment of creation to move creation forward to the point 
where everybody would be ready for the sun to come into the world. That would have happened sin or no sin. If you say the only reason Jesus came into the world was because of sin, you make the fall into a good thing. Well, it's a good thing we fell into sin or else we would never have been the bride of Christ. You want to say that? That's your alternative. Otherwise, you have to say, no, Jesus, the Son of God, would have been born into the world and we would have been the bride of Christ without sin. But, of course, he had to come in a terrible way because of our sin. That would have happened anyway. Reformed theologians, you can line up 50-50 on this, but half of them are wrong. And I, I can tell you which half are wrong, okay? And so the Holy Spirit brings us to Christ and Christ into the world, and then Jesus sends the Spirit again at Pentecost to bring us all back to the Father, right? At the end, He delivers the kingdom up to the Father. So this motion from the Father to the Son, and then the Son sending the Spirit to gather us and bring us back to the Father, that's there and back again. That's down into the labyrinth and back up. That's into the church and back out. That's what the Spirit does. So we want to think about that. How do we walk? Well, the second thing we can talk about in terms of motion is angelic motion. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to move like angels move. And I'll tell you how angels move. They move at right angles. They don't move in Fibonacci's. Sorry. You know, cats do. Dogs do, you know, a dog wants to go to bed and he, he gets in his bed and he goes round and round and round. He's just, that, that's, I mean, if you really knew, that was the Fibonacci series, I'm sure. But angels don't go that way. In Ezekiel chapter 1, we read how angels work. You know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says that as far as human beings are concerned, everything we do is mist and attempt to shepherd the wind. And uh, what we make like being a steam room you shepherd the wind together and make a shape and it blows apart well you can't shepherd the wind but God can God's cloud moves exactly the way he wants it to so you better trust in him and not trust in your own clouds and his cloud with the cherubim around it is revealed in Ezekiel chapter 1 and this is how it goes let's see Verse 12 of Ezekiel 1. Each went straight forward. Wherever the Spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. So the cherubim, which are the four posts of this chariot with wheels next to them, they never turn like this. They go straight forward. So if you're going to do the ox, go in the ox direction. You go, which way does the ox go? You go west. All right? If you want to get over here, you got to go this way and in this, this way, okay? Straight forward. In the midst of the living beings, cherubim, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth. The fire was bright and lightning was flashing through the fire. Inside this chariot, the spirit was going... And so the cherubim responding to this, they go this way, that way and up and down, and they never go in any oblique ways or curve, okay? They circumscribe squares and cubes. They come straight down on the earth, they go straight back up, and if they want to go over there, they go this way and that way. They only move in those movements, north, south, east, west, up, down. Those are military movements. They're a host. That's how armies march. Now, if you go, if you could find a traditional liturgical church, you'd find that's the way the clergy walk. They come straight down the aisle in front of the altar or the cross, and then they turn and move this way over to where their chair is, and they execute movements, and they sit down in their chair, then when it's time to get up, they go straight over here, and they turn this way, and they read the scripture, and they come over here, they turn this way and read the scripture. If they want to join with the congregation in prayer, they turn straight around and face this way. They never go crossing around in front or smudging around in the front of the church. You execute right and left 
movements like a soldier. I was trained to do this as an acolyte in the Lutheran Church. You know, it was time for the collection to be brought down front. The ushers would bring the collection down, and I'd get up out of my chair, and I'd come over here, right in the middle, and then I would turn and walk forward and receive the collection plates. And then I would execute an about face and walk straight forward and give them to the minister, and then I would go back, go back over here straight forward, and then straight back to my chair. None of this, they, this was the way it was supposed to be done when I was eight years old. <laughs> okay, Why? Why? Because those, that's the way angels walk. Because this is a military event. We are the host of God. Do you have to do this? Is God sitting up in heaven waiting for a chance to send fire down on you because you didn't conduct your service that way? No. Okay. But you're going to have to move somehow. If you have a, a church of any size, you're going to have to move around the front as a clergyman and other people are. You're going to have to move one way or the other. So if you've got a choice, you want to walk like angels walk or not. Me? I think I'll copy the angels. Because as a priest, and we're all priests, I'm an angel. These are the ritual movements. Now, the small, how small church, you have less form. You know, like I say, meet in somebody's living room, you kind of have to stand up and move around and everything. But when you have a larger building, you've got questions. How are we going to get into this room? How are we going to proceed around down front? If you've got a big table here, and then the pulpit's over here, and you've got another pulpit over here, how am I as a minister going to, and I've got my, my chair back here, my throne that I sit on or something, how am I going to move around? Move angelically like a slob. Well, now you know how I feel about it. Well, that's going to vary from church to church, from building to building, and everything else. Really, I mean, you can't, you don't want to be so artificial about this that you look weird. But you want to pay attention to it. And the Bible indicates to us something here, that just as we impose this square shape, these square sh uh, uh, rectangular shapes on the world, so there's a certain rectangularity of movement that takes place in these that it communicates the dignity and seriousness and the holiness of what is going on. The architecture of time, movement, another aspect of it is the day of the Lord. Now, we in our tradition use the expression day of the Lord to refer to a 24-hour period of time from midnight to midnight. But I don't think that's what the Bible means by it. The day of the Lord in the Old Testament is the time when God draws near and the people are in God's presence and they eat with him. So when the New Testament talks about the Lord's day, and it only does a couple of times, when John says, I was in the spirit in the day of the Lord, it probably means during worship service, not at some random time during the 24 hours of the uh, first day of the week. The New Testament calls that the first day of the week. The Lord's Day or Day of the Lord is actually the particular time of worship. I think the Lord's Day goes from the call to worship to the benediction and commissioning, and that's, that's the Day of the Lord. And uh, if you want to call Sunday the Lord's Day, you can, but I don't know that the New Testament does. During this Day of the Lord time, why are we here? Well, I've touched on this. The New Testament, Jesus' parables, he didn't say, a wealthy man gave a lecture series and invited James Jordan to come and speak. And many didn't come to the lecture series. And so he went out in the highways and byways and compelled them to come in and listen to this Jordan guy. No, it doesn't say that. It says a rich man gave a feast. And invited people to a feast where you eat food. Maybe it's milk and honey. Maybe it's dates from the date palm of Deborah or from the city of palm trees. Maybe it's donuts. Who knows what it is? But it's a feast, okay? That's what he's inviting him to. A king gave a marriage feast for his son, invited people to come. Every time the invitation is spoken of in the New Testament is to a feast. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Okay? Where do you find in the New Testament an invitation to go and hear a preacher? You don't. I'm sure they did. I mean, I'm sure that Paul was in town and people said, hey, come out and hear this guy. Uh, but that's not the way the New Testament is written. The focus is on, we have this feast to come to. Now, why? Well, it's because the church is the new temple. Now, in our tradition, we want to say the church is the new synagogue, which is kind of nice because since we don't know anything about the synagogue, that means we can do anything we want in church. But the New Testament never talks about the church as the new synagogue. It always talks about it as the temple. Peter, Paul, all the rest of them, we are a house of living stones. We gather together to offer sacrifices. We are living sacrifices. We give sacrifices of praise. The pastors of the seven churches in Asia Minor are called angels to the angel of the church. So believe it or not, this man is an angel. He's a priest. I don't know why he has shoes on, but he's not supposed to. Yeah, he can have shoes on. We won't stand on that. But you see, when we gather together, we're gathering not as a synagogue, but as a temple. And if you were an ancient Jew, and you were in the church and the synagogue at Corinth, and you walked next door into the where the church was meeting, you would know that you were not in Kansas anymore for two reasons. Number one, in the church, they were singing the temple psalms and not just singing them. They were singing them with musical instruments. Ephesians chapter four, 5, Seth, not saith. Ephesians. You've heard this before. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, and then this says, making melody with your heart. No, singing and playing music from your heart. The Greek word is psalo, P-S-A-L-L-O. It refers to the musical instrument called a psaltery, which is like a guitar. Now, I'm not arguing for guitars in church. Guitar is a romantic instrument that you sing love songs to your girlfriend with. It's not quite the right instrument for church, unless you have 20 or 30 of them going at once, in which case you're coming close to the temple. But singing and plucking instruments from your heart to the Lord. That's virtually a quotation from Psalm 98, which says, Sing praises and play music. Okay, What this tells us is, Unlike the synagogue, where they might have sung, but they would never have dared have musical instruments because they were just for the temple. When you went into the church, you had musical instruments. That's shocking. How dare these people do this? It's only to be done at the temple. And there's something even worse. In the church, shocking enough to come in, they are the minister is taking a piece of bread, and then he breaks it, and he says, this is Jesus' memorial. Jesus said, do this for my memorial. He didn't say, do this in, to help you remember me. That's not a good translation. He says, do this for my memorial to remind the Father. So as a memorial is something objective that's done or put in place that God sees it reminds him. I know you've been taught on this before. But what's important here is, Every day in the temple, every morning and every evening, the priest, you can read about this in Leviticus 2, would take bread and he would break it and he would say, this is Yahweh's memorial, and he would put it on the altar and then he would save some of it and eat it himself and the other priest would eat it. But no layman ever ate it. This is a temple thing. It's called the tribute offering or the grain offering or the cereal offering. Now back in the days of Josiah, it was a sin to do that ritual anywhere but the temple. And the people who were doing it on high places, Josiah had them killed. Because you're not allowed to do that anywhere but the temple. Now you know where Saul of Tarsus got his ideas from. Righteous Jew, these Christians, worshiping on high places, breaking memorial bread, putting up 
fake temples everywhere. This is blasphemy. The law says, if you do that, you should be put to death. Godly King Josiah put people for, for, to death for that. So, Saul is going to go out and put people to death for it. Serious stuff. Look, <laughs> nobody ever confused those church meetings with the synagogue. You would never have done that in a synagogue. Only in the temple. And that's the scandal, you see. The churches were saying, we're the temple now. And not only that, but everybody gets to have some of the bread, not just the priests. Ooh. Bet that made some priests mad. Not only that, but in the, in the ritual, in the daily ritual, after the priest broke bread and said, this is Yahweh's memorial, then he took wine and he just poured it out on the ground. They weren't able, able to drink it. <laughs> well, now the Christians are coming along saying, we get to drink with God. See, Sam Adams, I mean Jesus Christ. See, right here. Jesus wine. We get to, that means the kingdom has come in its fullness. What was poured out before because we're not allowed to have it yet, now we get to have. This is all temple stuff, you see. Dramatically, in your face, temple stuff. Well, we are gathering for a meal then, and the emphasis is on that. Paul says in Corinthians, when you get together, it is not to have the Lord's Supper because you're not doing it right. He doesn't say when you get together, you are abusing the sermon. Some of you are falling asleep during the sermon. Some of you are having the sermon start before everybody else gets there. That's not what he says. He says the big scandal is you're abusing the Lord's Supper. You're starting to chow down before everybody else gets there. I mean, what is this? You're not sitting at table with one another. That's, that's what we're here for. Now, what does that mean about the sermon? Well, we don't need a sermon. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Quite the reverse. The words are right there with the table. Now, I want to suggest to you there are two different kinds of events here. You can have a teaching service where you have songs, hymns, lecture, and you can talk about all kinds of things like I am, like what we're doing here today. You can study the genealogies of Chronicles 1 through 9. One of the boring parts of the Bible. Okay? But you probably wouldn't preach a sermon on that. A sermon is a message of the Word of God that's given at the table. Just as Jesus at the Last Supper sat and talked with his disciples for quite a while afterwards. Remember John 14, 15, 16. That's an example. That came after they were served the food. We do it before for good, good ritual reasons. But the message on the Lord's Day is somewhat table qualified because it's going to lead to the meal. It's going to lead to the offering and from that to the meal. It's not just information. So you see, that tells us something architectural. That the table is the central piece of furniture in the room that wants to draw that we want the eye drawn to. Now see, our Bacterian heritage in the United States doesn't give us this. The pulpit is this great big huge thing and we have a little table down here. And so when you come in the church your eye goes to the pulpit and the idea of having a table that your eyes go to we think is Catholic. But in reality the Catholics don't have so much a table as they have an altar up against the wall. You're not looking at a table that's in the midst that you're gathered around unless you go to a modern Catholic church. Some of them have shaped up in this point. Or, but you tend to look at that. So that's not really what we're talking about at all. This event is gathering at a feast, and you hear a message at the feast. Anybody, any of you guys who were ever in the military may have gone to a dining inn, okay? It's a formal, ritualized meal. You stand at attention, then you sit down. You don't do anything until this has happened and that has happened. And then they serve the food, and then the commander gives his message, all right? And there are all these other rituals involved. Now this is what we're here for. The commander of the host, his uh, adjutant, the pastor, is going to give the message. He's going to give us the words from the commander of the host at the, at the meal where the army gets together. 
That's the idea. You see, the Bible is a very military book. In ancient Israel, every man was required to be a member of the militia. The Psalms were written by a warrior. The whole book is about war. And we have, you know, we have a clergy, most of which have never worn a uniform. And they're trying to read the Bible and understand it when they have almost no feeling whatsoever for the kind of people who wrote it or who were its first audience. So we ought to just kick out of the ministry anybody who wasn't in the military. Well, I'm not saying that. But if you weren't, I mean, we have to kind of put ourselves into those feet and think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Psalm 23, that sweet, loving psalm about being a shepherd and a sheep. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. Makes me to lie down in green pastures. You know, I'm just like a little kitty and he's taking care of me. Then it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What's what do you mean, in the presence of my enemies? All of a sudden you realize, this is a psalm that you sing on the battlefield, and over there are the Philistines. Makes it different. Maybe it's you've just kind of come into the promised land, and up there is Jericho. And there's a whole bunch of giants out there. And then God says, by the way, I want you all you men to circumcise yourselves. <laughs> hey, Lord, could we wait till we defeated Jericho? You know... <laughs> We're going to be sore for a week. Nope. You're going to all have to circumcise yourselves and just trust me, he says. Trust me. All circumcised. So maybe can, we, can we do it in secret so they don't see what we're doing? No. I want you to make a big hill of foreskins out here so that all these Canaanites can see that you're incapacitated. Then after that, he says, spend a week doing Passover. You will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, there's a test of faith. <laughs> I don't think Mel Gibson will probably make a movie out of that, but uh, still, uh, when you think about it, it is a test of faith. All right. Yes, ouch. It goes back to Genesis, you know, where the wicked sons of Jacob had the men circumcised and then fell on them and murdered them all while they were incapacitated. So... The Jews knew about this, and this is eye for eye and tooth for tooth. God is saying, this is what your forefathers did to the men of Shechem, and now I'm going to do it to you. It's an eye for eye world, and he protected them. Well, at, our, at any rate, that's the way, that's the context of this book. So to think of worship as a military type of experience, among other things, we sing in these psalms, which are all about warfare, and we're thinking about defeating the principalities and powers. And if you don't have any enemies around here, well, then just think about all your brothers and sisters in Africa who are being murdered by Muslims all over the place. And sing it for them, okay? They need these imprecatory psalms. So sing for them. And um, that's going to uh, shape our architecture a little bit. It's going to shape what gathering at the meal means. So there's a sense in which designing our designing your room, you want to make sure that your table is highlighted because we're gathering for a meal. This is what we are coming in for, okay, among other things. Going into the labyrinth, we're going into death and, res and coming back out of resurrection to have our sins taken away again. As Jesus went to the cross, into the middle of the cross, we're going up to have the feast with God. We're going to the crossroads of the world where the cherubim are and where the holy place is. All of those things we're going to, we're coming back out of in this room. It has something of a design to it that reminds us of these things. Finally, architecture of time. We talked about the spirit as the music of God. Well, we need to think about music in the church. Not just what music we sing. You all don't need to be told that. But you need to think about the architecture of music. That blazes the question, where do you put your choir? Should you have a choir? Well, of course, you have one Reformed opinion that says, in the New Testament, everyone is in the choir, so you shouldn't have a choir. Well, that's not the way worship is pictured in Revelation. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Read Revelation 4 and 5 and 19, and you'll find that the angels are divided into several choirs, and they sing back and forth with each other. 
and you have smaller groups that sing and provide leadership to larger groups of angels. Now, historically in the church, we have three kinds of singing back and forth in worship. We have responsorial singing when the minister, and if he doesn't have a good voice, someone who does, some man who does, a male voice, a foundational voice, an octave lower than a woman's voice. If you understand the principles of music and harmonics, you know that the lower voice is fundamental. And uh, you need a man's voice for this. Sings the man's part. The Lord be with you. And you sing back. And also with you. Okay, that's responses. And you can do psalms that way. Okay. Why well, do the heathen imagine a vain thing? You know, kings of the earth take their stand, back and forth, whatever. Now, then there's antiphonal singing, where the church divides in half. You all do that here, okay? You go back and forth. And then there's choir and congregational singing back and forth. And a lot of times, psalms are sometimes done that way. If you have a chant psalm, the congregation doesn't know as a whole. You give the congregation a response to sing, and the choir sings back and forth with the congregation. In order for that to take place, the choir needs to be next to the congregation, not in the back, not in the front. In the front, the choir is entertaining the congregation. That's out. Okay, worship is not entertainment. We are not here to be entertained. We're here to be sacrificed. Okay, we're here to have the word of God, which is alive and powerful, cut us into pieces, and divide us asunder, and soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and. Uh, lay us open and then put us into the fire and glorify us and put us all back together again. Now, we're not coming here to be entertained. None of this clapping your hands after you hear something you like. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Kyrie eleison. Oh, no, clap your hands in rhythm when you sing some of the psalms, yes, but uh, don't applaud. Save that for the theater. No, no, this is too serious for that. But having the choir back behind is also problematic because that way, I mean, they can support the congregation. And the way your church is laid out right now, this building is laid out, I wouldn't change that. You know, you don't have, your space doesn't allow things. But if you're thinking of a design, I'll put the, car, the choir on one side down toward the front to where... You can sing choir and congregation back and forth with each other. And if there's a special choir number, it's still to the side, not right in front. So it's not like entertainment. It's like participating with the congregation and leading in worship. So choir on one side and your instruments on the other or instruments and choir together. My, con my consensus on placement of choir is that, to the side. And if you don't do it that way, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, those are some thoughts on architecture of time. We could say things about, you know, the ritual of the Lord's Supper and other things. Uh, but, but here again, I'm firmly convinced that uh, we need to be seated to receive the Lord's Supper, that the minister should serve himself first as Christ's representative. Uh, this is the ancient way. Uh, uh, not doing it that way is very, very recent. In fact, you go to churches, I don't know what you do here anymore, so I'm, I don't, I'm not stepping on anyone's toes because I can't see any toes. <laughs> so I'm sure this is going to insult everybody. This is no, everybody does things differently. But um, you couldn't have everybody wait and drink together as long as you were using a common cup. It's kind of hard to have more than one person at a, you know, drink at the same time from a common cup. And in order to have little cups, you had to have modern manufacturing ability. The ability to make little glass cups, a whole bunch of them cheap enough for a church to buy, or plastic cups. That's only about 100 years old or so. So the whole business of having little cups is about 100 years old. Now, I'm not opposed to little cups, but what I'm saying is, 150 years ago in a Presbyterian church or a Baptist church or wherever you went, you had a common cup. And you didn't have people waiting and drinking together or waiting and eating together. And that's not what Jesus did at the Lord's Supper. They partook as the elements were passed. The meaning is that Jesus would drink first and show that it's okay. And the minister 
as the, as the cup bearer to the king and y'all are the king, he tastes first, he drinks first, and then he passes it to you, and then you pass it hand to hand. Uh, now again, churches in small situations, not yet getting everything formed up, may feel that their architecture doesn't allow them to do all these things conveniently. So adjustments are made. But when you begin to think about a church, then you want to think about setting things up in such a way that the, that ritual movement is possible where people remain seated like they were at the Last Supper and they pass the elements hand to hand. I go to churches where they want the minister or the elders to serve each person individually. Well, look at the Last Supper. Jesus went around and washed each of their feet individually. But he did not serve them individually. They passed it around. He had a choice. He could have gone around and served each one individually, but he didn't do that. What kind of space do we want organized for this? Would it be good to have the elders come and sit around the table at the communion part and have the minister, instead of standing up and leading the communion service, maybe he should sit down and do it all sitting down. Jesus was sitting down. Why do we, the minister stands up behind the table and does all this. Why don't you sit down and do it all? That would be radical. But it would communicate the idea of rest and meal. And then the minister can drink from a common cup and pass that common cup around the elders. Then the elders can get up and take little cups to everybody. Now you see, that's going to, your architecture, the way you design your space, if you decide to do that, which I recommend, then you're going to have a larger table. You're going to have enough room for that, chairs for it, the appointments for it, enough space for the elders to get out then and then start flowing it out like a river that flows from that central table out to everybody else. And, of course, the bread the same way. Start the bread around and then start passing it out from the elders. That's going to be an architecture. If you don't do it that way, I mean, if you want everybody to get into it lines and come up front and be served individually by the minister or something, then you're going to have a different kind of architecture in the front. You're going to design your building differently. Okay. So, um, probably my suggestion is one that no one in this room is doing right now. But that's, you know, you need to think about that. And I'm right. <laughs> Today, yes, this is this is my current thinking. As uh, as Douglas Wilson says, I don't think I'm always right, but I always think I'm right. So what I'm saying to you are the things that I think are right, but it may be that some of them are wrong. But I'm just too dumb to see it. But at any rate, you know your ritual of time, how you approach the table, how the stuff flows out from the table to the people. Or if you're having the people come down to the table, all of those things are going to affect how you design the room. So your, your ritual of time is important to architecture. So now we can take questions for a couple minutes on anything so far. Yeah. Well, that's what happened that last night. Are you that should be the order? No, I don't think that should be the order. I, I, well, I think that can be the order. I mean, it could be that on certain occasions you want to go through the service and have, you know, uh, scripture readings and maybe a brief word before the t before the table, and then afterwards sit around and talk. There might be. There might be some occasions where that would be a good thing to do, but I think the normal thing following the ritual patterns in the Bible is for the, uh, the sermon to be part of the ascension, part of the service, and therefore precede the, the table. You yeah. That the early church, uh, church assembly for the reasons of the feast. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we open the feast to just the two elements? 
because because we're in the wilderness and it's it's a simplified and symbolic feast uh, now here's one way you do it okay you stop using little teeny weeny crackers or wafers and things that are just artificial little pieces of styrofoam and you go to real bread that tastes good okay so you get some king's hawaiian bread or something like that and you let people take a real piece okay and you stop using grape juice which has no shalom in it and you start using wine which is celebrate celebratory and especially in uh cultures without a great deal of discretionary money i mean we're so rich now that we can have wine for dinner every night if we want but it didn't used to be that way and wine was somewhat expensive in fact uh, some scholars have suggested that when jesus says in connection with the bread he doesn't say this uh, he says do this as my memorial but in connection with the wine he says do this as often as you do it as my memorial that that may partly reflect the fact that wine is expensive and then Sunday by Sunday, they might not be able to afford to have wine every week. If we could put convenience aside, would we go back to the feast? I think it's useful to have, uh, I don't, the early church apparently had a covered dish dinner, what we call that. A covered dish dinner, a shared meal, when they came together. Not at the same time as the Lord's Supper, but as part of coming together. Uh, it's called an agape. And I think churches do that. I mean, I, they may not do it on Sunday morning. Um, some churches, uh, at least once a month, they have a meal after church. They invite everybody to stay. Uh, some will do it at, on, on a different night of the week or something like that. I think most churches instinctively do some kind of an agape. But doing it at the same time as the ritual of the Lord's Supper, I don't think is necessary. I think it is important to be part of the life of the church, though. And, and, just, and just so, the kinds of things that Paul says in 1 Corinthians need to apply there. You know, the rich not eating with themselves and ignoring the poor and all the rest. But that, that's one of the exegetical cruxes is... Is that agape meal somehow or other linked in with the Lord's Supper, or was it, you know, an hour before the service started or something? The consensus of scholarship, Joachim Eremias' book on the Eucharistic words of Jesus, is that they were, they were distinct things. You had the ritual meal, you also had the, the uh, assembly getting together for a common meal. And that they were both important, but they weren't blended. It would change the architecture, yeah. And you see, in, in, the, uh, in the older Presbyterian churches, many times there was a view of having a very wide aisle and then setting up tables up and down the aisle so everybody would sit at a table. Uh, in, the, in some of the Dutch churches, you actually, you'd have a room like this and then over there you'd have just as much space with tables on it and when you, when you, when it's time for the supper, everybody gets up and goes over and sits, sits at those tables, and you do the supper. Uh, you got to have a lot of space for that. Now, I'm not sure it works very well, but uh, I think pew communion can work if people are gathered, sort of facing each other rather than kind of the way things are here. This is more problematic because you're not really looking at other people so much. But if you if you look. Uh, I have a book that's got a whole lot of pictures of, of uh, Reformation era churches. And many times you have a great big, t I'll draw it. You have a, a, a large room like this, and you have a pulpit area here that's raised up. And then right out here you have this huge table. And you have pews here, and you have a lot of pews here, and a lot of pews here. Okay, there's not a lot of action in terms of the center aisle going on here, but there is this total feel of being around this table and the word being right here at the table too. So, you know, there's different ways to do this, but that's a thought. Was there, yeah? I think that there should be a fountain, like an Ezekiel flowing out of the sanctuary. Um, I think that's a nice thing to have. Uh, it could 
<laughs> yeah, a, a lot of churches, uh, a lot of Roman Catholic churches now will use that space right there. Uh, as you come in, the pews are a little bit shorter so that you have a square area. And they'll have a fountain with water flowing down four sides of it and cascading down into a pool. So that when somebody's baptized, they step into this pool and then the, the priest will take water out of this fountain. And they might even have a plant in there. I've seen several churches like this in our area. So they have it back there toward the door for that reason. That's kind of an interest thing. You know, that's a real expensive thing to put in your church. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a fine thing to do. Don't think it's necessary, but I... Uh, it, it's a, it would be one more good thing out of the Bible to remind some things or whether you put it there or over here I'm inclined to think that the water is closer to the center and I would do the baptismal stuff if you had the choir over here I'd have the baptismal area over here but I would have it elevated and I would have it a large space for it not just some little teeny weeny thing like most churches have the, the, the Jordan River ran down the center of the land, so they had to come to the middle, and the, the tribes on the far side had to come to the middle to pass through the Jordan and then go back. So the idea of having the, uh, the waters near the, near the table, near the throne, rather than far out, uh, is a nice one. Not, I, don't, I don't think there's any law there. It can go either place. Yeah. Well, and, you know, in our Assembly of God days, it was great to have all that muscle. Yeah. <laughs> but in our day, we do experience negatively that um, we'll sing our hearts out. We still can't hardly hear. Yeah, well, you've got, you've got to get rid of some of those soft surfaces, that's for sure. Um, and you're just going to have to get an acoustical engineer into that building to give you some advice uh, what what is possible to be done. I don't... Acoustical engineering is an extremely difficult matter. I remember when I was about 11 years old and I used to listen to the New York Philharmonic on the radio and they had just opened up Lincoln Center and the first concert in the Lincoln Center Auditorium. Um, I remember the orchestra played, and of course it sounded okay on the radio, but then when we got to the halftime, <laughs> to the intermission, they were talking about, this sounds horrible in here. <laughs> and they actually had to cancel, they had to move all the concerts for that first year of the New York Philharmonic back to the old hall and completely redo Lincoln Center Hall because the acoustics were so bad. Well, that shows you how tough it is you know, to do it right, even you know, they had in New York City with the best experts in the world, they completely blew it. So this this can be a tough question, especially in a large room. Uh, you don't want to amplify stuff very much. See, ideally, you want to have that at the minimum. Uh, that's cheating. But you, you ask what the Bible has to say about it. The answer is not much because actually the temple and the tabernacle were not places where people gathered to do this stuff. Uh, you do have the notion that the temple was on a high mountain in Jerusalem and when the orchestra and chorus were made, that made a lot of noise that would have resounded over the hills. Uh, so the idea of having a big sound and an echoey situation is, is there in the Bible, but... You know, sometimes people want to come up with rather artificial principles of architecture and say, oh, well, we should, we should be absolutely true, and if you use cement blocks, then it's sinful to cover them up with wood or something. The tabernacle is wood overlaid with gold. I mean, make your design the way you want. 
I don't think the Bible has that much detail to say to us, except that we want to hear each other because singing is one of the ways that we want another one another. And so if people can't hear each other sing, and if people are afraid to sing because, you know, they can't hear anybody else to join in with, that's a major spiritual problem. One of the reasons the Puritans had so much trouble with assurance of salvation is that they squashed music out of their worship. They sang one or two things, so slow is molasses. Well, the Spirit, when the Spirit comes, I mean, it's musical instruments, it's now, cymbals, trumpets, and str mass stringed instruments. That's a lot of instruments. And it's loud, vigorous singing. And we know that, you know, in Calvin's Geneva, they sang these psalms like we're doing here. They sang them real fast. Uh, it was very exciting. They didn't have any problems with assurance of salvation in Calvin's Geneva. But when you suck, music is a tremendous way to minister to people and make them feel like they're part of the spiritual community. And when you have decided that music is dangerous or unspiritual and you take it out, you start to have spiritual problems. So I think pastorally speaking, it's important to correct your situation, okay? So people can hear each other and be encouraged by each other and join together. Yes, sir. Uh, I think I'm picking up on the question over there, but I, I've heard recently that, that when, that when uh, Jesus did the first last uh, that he didn't count the lamb, the, 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 the meat part, it was the, the, the wine and the bread, but the, the meat part wasn't there. And in the old uh, Passover, it was the lamb, because he was the lamb. He was at the table. Is that, uh, is that given any credibility today? Um. That sounds nice, but I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I mean, I realize that when I come and speak, I say a lot of things that sound cool, but I don't say them until I, until I feel that I've got something besides just that sounds nice behind me. And what you said sounds nice, but I'm not sure I can work that. Um, see, the, the difficulty is we're not sure that the Last Supper was a Passover meal. The Passover meal consisted of lamb, and there's nothing about that. And what Jesus, we don't know what they had at the meal. What Jesus does at the Lord's Supper is the rite of Leviticus 2, of the grain offering. It's, it's got nothing to do with Passover. Passover, you don't have uh, this breaking of bread as a memorial. That's not part of the ritual at all. And you certainly wouldn't do it in the home. So Jesus is treating himself as Yahweh and his men as priests. And he's, he, is, he is putting himself in the place of God uh, doing this ritual and eating it himself, where the priest would give it to God and share it among the priests. Jesus is eating it and sharing it among these disciples. So it's, it's a fairly radical thing for him to do. Uh, if it's Thursday night and Passover was on Friday, then what's going on? You've got all these speculations that maybe there were two Passovers that year, or maybe uh, it's just Passover time, and but they're having a meal among themselves. Where are their wives? Why aren't their whole families with them? This doesn't look like a Passover meal. Um, you wouldn't, I mean, the wives would have been there and the kids would have been there. So, so where are they? Uh, scholars that really go around and around on this, uh, obviously it counts as Passover because the Gospels link it with Passover when they say, Jesus says, I was going to celebrate this Passover with you and, you know, find a room for Passover and all that. But was, was this the actual Passover meal and day or is it just, theologically associated with Passover by the rhetoric that the Gospels use and cause it was at the same time. I don't know, and I'm not going to die for any view of it. You know, it fulfills Passover. It also fulfills all the other feasts of the Old Testament. But uh, whether they had just finished chowing down on a leg of lamb or, <laughs> or, or this was something else, I really don't know. The text really doesn't tell us at all. Go ahead. Um, this, is, this is on the side of it. Uh -huh. And I wondered what you, you know, in terms of your, your knowledge, would, would say about that, that that was just a local thing because of uh, no shoes and dirty, you know, walking in the dirt. Oh, no, place. no. Uh, uh, it, it starts in Genesis 3 where God says, Cursed is the ground with reference to you. 
soil transmits a judgment from God. And so you have the need to wash feet for ritual reasons in the Old Testament. The priests, when they came into the sanctuary, had to wash their feet. And then when they got blood on their hands, they had to wash their hands. Now, those are two different things. One is to kind of get the dirt off of you. The other is to get the holiness off of you. Okay, so you want to get into ritual studies, <laughs> there's a lot there. But when Jesus washes their feet, this, this is an Old Testament ritual washing that has to do with uh, putting them on holy ground. You know, you take your shoes off to be on holy ground. Now, for that reason, this doesn't get ritualized in the New Testament because those rituals of entering holy ground are over with uh, when Jesus ascends to heaven. Uh, we have a different situation. But, having said that, then the, the, the place where Jesus washes our feet is when we confess sins in the worship service. That's the foot washing part. Uh, and then we're, we're, we hear the absolution declaration of forgiveness. That's the foot washing part. We come in here with dirty feet because we've been wandering around in Egypt. <laughs> and uh, we get clean feet. Now, actually, a lot of traditional churches on the Thursday night service, the minister, uh, the bishop in particular, the bishop will wash people's feet in his church. So, for instance, Bishop N.T. Wright was telling us that you know, he just recently became a bishop and this was the first time he had to wash feet and uh, so he was up for it you know he'd seen it done and uh, but he said it, he was in his white robe and and um, he had his pulpit mic on and <laughs> he's washing feet and it was scraping around he, he was describing all of the chaos that he should have gotten that mic off of him before he started doing this but yeah I mean it's not just some different groups here that read the Bible and say, hey, that's cool, let's do that. Um, it's that uh, Catholic and, and Episcopal churches and other churches have a tradition of just kind of doing that once a year so that the, so that the bishop, the highest rank in the church, has to go down and be the lowest of all people and wash somebody's filthy feet. Okay? So, you know, that's fine but it's not something that's required or necessary. It's, it's just a, a custom that you can see has a certain communicative value. Jim, in the Anglican church, when is that done? Is that on Monday? Thursday? Yeah, it's not on Thursday of Holy Week. Do you want to take a, a break for a few minutes? Yeah, we could take uh, five minutes. Okay. Okay.